All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, today to have uh, Professor Bharat Hariharan from uh, Cornell University to talk about uh, visual learning with fewer labels. Uh, Bharat is an assistant professor in computer science at Cornell, with, where he focuses on, on, building, on building systems that can learn uh, visual concepts with uh, fewer data requirements. And previously, he was a postdoctoral uh, post post researcher at Facebook AI Research, working with Ross Gershik, Peter Dollar, and Larry Zidnick, amongst others, and also a postdoc researcher at uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, and he did his PhD at uh, Berkeley, working with Professor Jitendra Malik on fusion learning, 3D reconstruction, and 3D object detection, amongst others. Uh, thank you a lot, Bharat, for, for coming, and we are very excited to hear your talk. Um, thanks, Xavier. Uh, I am going to stop my video if people, if everyone's fine, because there might be um, some background movement that might be distracting. Um, okay. Um, I hope everyone can see slides. Please um, feel free to interrupt if uh, there's any issue or if you have any questions. Um, the so. I'm going to be talking today about uh, work that I and colleagues and my students have been doing on uh, visual learning with fewer labels. Um, to set the stage, uh, I'm assuming all of us here are uh, very much aware of all the advances that we have in uh, recognition today. So you can today get recognition systems that can take an image like this and say that this image is a partridge. Now, uh, hidden underneath is the fact that this system has been trained, has basically seen thousands of examples of partridges before. This requirement that the system needs to see thousands of training examples of each class in order to recognize them accurately is a bit problematic. So in particular, and why is that in particular, there's two reasons. One is that many organic, or, organically collected data sets usually do not have like e an equal number of examples per class. Usually you have a heavy tail uh, distribution of classes. So you have some classes such as um, those on uh, the left, which have very few training examples, which have, which have lots of training examples, but there's this heavy tail of classes on the right, which have very few training examples. And this is always the case if you uh, simply collect a set of images and annotate what's in them, because there are simply, there are some objects which are very, very common in images, and there are some objects which are very, very rare. Um, now, the fact that they're rare does not mean that we should ignore them, because often um, they can, in fact, be more valuable because to uh, recognize. For example, if you are in, um, an ecology and, and, and environmental conservationist, then you really do want to know about the rare animal species which might be endangered, for example. Um, often things might also be rare because they are difficult to annotate and you need expertise to annotate them. You need expertise to uh, distinguish them from similar objects. The other kind of setting up uh, happens when you imagine uh, vision systems being deployed in, for example, robots or autonomous agents. So for example, let's say you train a self-driving car um, and your perception system for a self-driving car and you trained it in, let's say, Arizona, and now you take your self-driving car out to Colorado and you run into this deal. Now, you, the, your perception system may not recognize this deer. So you want your perception system to very quickly learn about this deer so that it does not have to encounter a thousand more animals and run them over before it starts to do the right thing. So for both these reasons, it's important that a recognition system be able to learn new classes with very few training examples. Unfortunately, if we take current recognition systems, they have a problem with these rare classes or with these classes which have very few training examples. So here what I'm showing is I took a, a recognition system which already um, was able, had been trained on something like 600 uh, classes with lots of training examples. And then um, it was provided an additional roughly 300 classes that it needed to uh, add to its vocabulary. And on the x-axis is the number of training examples that it got, and on the y-axis is the overall accuracy. And as you can see, as the train number of training examples 
is reduced from a hundred to a 10 to a one, the accuracy basically falls off a cliff. So this is a problem for current recognition systems. In contrast, humans actually are really good at this. So this, I'm not actually going to run this experiment here. I've run this many times. So I take my word for it that it's going to go um, as I say. So here's a single, here's a new uh, class um, this is, that is hopefully unfamiliar to many of you. This animal is called a Philippine Darcia. And for those of you who have never seen this animal before, regard this as your train set. Now I show you this test set where we have three different um, animals and I ask you to say which of these is uh, Philippine Darcia. And no matter which audience I show this to, uh, almost everyone correctly identifies that the animal on the top is in fact a Philippine Darcia, whereas the other two animals are not Philippine Darcias. And we are able to do this in spite of the fact that at least some of these animals, for example, the mouse limo here, is in fact a very close cousin. So why do current recognition systems find this challenging? And what is it that humans are leveraging that machines are not? Um, first, why is it challenging? Well, the challenge is should be uh, fa fairly clear to us. The challenge is that the, there's a huge amount of intra-class variation. Um, any class that we are asking these recognition systems to recognize usually has a lot of different modes of appearance. And any single example is not enough to capture this diversity of appearances, be it changes in background, changes in scale, changes in pose, and so on. So if there is, if no single example is in, suffices to capture all these modes of variation, how is it that we humans can do this? Well, one reason might be that different classes often share modes of intra-class variation. So for example, here are two different classes for well, the, the top row is examples of the great blue heron and the bottom row is examples of um, the black stork. And as you can see, the, all these birds appear, both these bird species appear in roughly the same kinds of modes. They appear either standing on the ground or flying uh, in the air. Um, they, they appear in different sorts of backgrounds and so on. So this fact that different classes, although each class has a lot of interclass variation, but different classes might share these modes of variation, this fact can be leveraged in two ways. One way is that when our recognition system encounters this new class with a single example, it might refer back to its past visual experience with similar classes. It might recall that it has seen stocks which look similar and which have many different modes of variation. And then it might use this uh, memory to hallucinate or imagine what this new bird species might look like in these different modes of variation. So what this new uh, bird species might look like if it was flying in the sky or standing on the ground. Um, an alternative strategy is that instead of hallucinating all these different modes of variation, the recognition system might instead use or represent these images using features which are invariant to these common modes of variation. So it might uh, look at this image and say, well, the pose of the bird is not really important. The background is also probably not that important. What's important is that this bird has a long beak, it has a long neck, it has a gray body color, and it has uh, some sort of a black stripe on its forehead. So um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to uh, talk about how we can um, leverage these two different kinds of, uh, well, these two different strategies for um, using this key insight, which is the different classes share modes of variation. Um, and we are going to, so to concretize the problem set up a bit more, this is how uh, we're going to imagine things look. So first, our system is going to get a set of uh, common classes, which we call base classes, which have lots of training examples. On these base classes, 
the uh, recognition system can learn um, a feature representation and any other modules it needs to learn. Then it gets deployed and it encounters some novel classes which have very few training examples. And the job of this recognition system is to use maybe its prior experience, the feature, feature representations it's learned and so on and so forth to learn a good classifier for the novel classes. Um, the, the classifier might be a classifier that only operates on the novel classes, or it might be a classifier that has to distinguish between both the novel and the base classes. So with that, let me uh, get into these uh, two different strategies. So the first strategy that I'm going to look at is this notion of learning these modes of variation, uh, in particular learning to hallucinate additional examples of a novel class based on the visual experience the learner has with uh, pr previously seen similar classes. So um, this is how the pipeline is going to look. So the learner gets these uh, novel classes, which have very few training examples. Separately, we assume, or you can imagine, that the learner has some understanding of the space of different uh, modes of variation or different transformations that uh, any of these image or any image can undergo without um, essentially changing the class label. What the learner can do is it can sample images for any of these novel classes, sample some transformation from the space of transform transformations, and use these to produce a new training example for this class. This new training example then gets added to the training set um, and now we have, uh, the learner has a larger training set to learn from. Now you, you're probably thinking this is exactly the same as data augmentation, and it is, with the uh, added assumption that we kind of want the space of transformations we are using here to be much more uh, diverse, so that it can actually capture sort of the uh, entire um, distribution of this particular class. So the key challenge here is figuring out the space of transformations and um, how to do the transformation for any given uh, image. And because we want this space of transformations to be sophisticated enough to capture the full diversity, it's not, it does not suffice to use simple transformations like rotations and uh, background or, um, random cropping or um, color jitter. We need to learn these transformations. And in particular, we need to learn this so that the resulting examples that we produce actually end up being useful for learning a classifier for this novel class. So how do we do this? How do we learn this kind of uh, an augmentation engine? Um, we're going to we, we are going to use a framework uh, for learning this, which I'm going to call meta learning. The word meta learning is um, usually applied to specific kinds of techniques, but I'm going to generalize um, that the, the term here in the following day. So if we think about what we want, what we want is a system denoted by H here, which takes a small labeled training set and an unlabeled test set and produces class probabilities on the test set. And internally, you know, this uh, learner edge might do many different things. It might run a training algorithm on the training set and then use the resulting model on the test set, or it might do something else entirely. What we want is that there are certain, um, there are certain parts of this learner, uh, this uh, learning system edge, in our case, this data augmentation engine, that need to be trained. So what we are going to do is that we're not going to dwell too much on the internals of this um, system edge. Instead, we are going to abstract it off as a black box with some parameters W. So these parameters W might be, for example, the parameters of the feature representation, but also it might be the parameters of this um, data augmentation engine. And what we are going to do is we are going to um, think of this as a, a machine learning problem and simply learn these parameters. 
Now, how do we learn these parameters? So again, what we are doing here is we are thinking of this entire system as basically a parametric function that takes a small label training set as input and a test set um, that takes a small label training set and a test set as input and produces class probabilities. So how do we train this uh, function, this learner? To train this, what we need is a data set of these kinds of problems, a data set where each element of this data set corresponds to a small label training set and a test set. So we're going to call this a meta data set. So each of each um, in the, this meta data set essentially consists of a series of classification problems. Um, each classification problem has a label training set and a label test set. So these, I'm, um, you should think of the training sets and the test sets in each classification problem as being in code. So they're not actually our, to the, the training and test set we're interested in, they are just simulations. So what we are in, in effect going to do is we are going to take maybe some large data set, some large pre-training data set. Um, remember in our problem setup, we have this large set of uh, classes, which we called base classes with lots of examples. So from this large data set, we are going to sample a classification problem. And we are going to do that by basically sampling a training set and a test set. So again, these are simulations. They are simulated from our base class training set. And we simulate a small training set with labels and a small test set. We feed the training set with labels and images from the test set to this uh, learner, this function edge and it produces class probabilities. We then use the known labels on this test set. Remember, this is a simulation. So these, this test set is in fact just drawn from our training uh, data set. So we know the labels. So we are going to use those labels to um, score this uh, output probability distribution and computer loss, which is then back propagated to affect, uh, to um, train these parameters W. So, in some, what's happening here is we are going to train this learner edge through a series of these simulated classification problems where we feed it a training set and a test set and make sure that it gives correct predictions on the test set, on the simulated test set. This kind of training is sometimes also called episodic training. How does this, uh, so this, by the way, this broad framework describes a whole lot of work, a whole, a whole lot of papers. Um, this list actually finishes in, ends in 2017. There's, um, uh, the, the list actually goes on and on and on. So I'm not actually uh, going to talk about uh, all the different techniques that have come up here. Um, there's many different, up the, all these techniques basically differ in how you design this function edge. Um, for our purposes, you know, all we need is this framework. Now, how are we going to use this to train our data augmentation engine? So, oh, actually, before I go forward, I do, do want to give one example of this um, function edge, um, what this function edge looks like. And the example I'm going to use is from this paper called Prototypical Networks. It's the simplest version of this idea and it works quite reasonably well. Um, the basic idea behind prototypical networks, remember the goal of this function H is that it needs to take a training set and a test set and produce predictions on the test set. So well, how does the prototypical network work? It takes this training set, it embeds all the different uh, training examples into uh, an intermediate feature space. So um, the colors here represent the different classes. And then given any, uh, for, for every class, it computes a class prototype, which is just the average of all the feature vectors corresponding to each class. And then given any test example, it simply assigns it to the nearest class prototype. So this is basically just a version of nearest neighbors with a learned feature space. And the parameters of the, that, that are being uh, trained through meta learning are basically the parameters of this feature extractor fee. So as you can see, the method of this is a very complicated way of describing an extremely simple sort of uh, metric learning -y, uh, approach, but the framework itself is going to be useful for us. 
Okay, so this is the meta learning framework. We have our training and test uh, images that are fed into this learner and it produces a class probabilities. Now to train, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to define a data augmentation engine that looks like this. What it does is it takes a real training image along with a label and some noise and it produces a new training image and with the, with the a new sort of um, hallucinated image with the same label. So standard generator um, and generative modeling stuff. Um, I've shown here with images, but in uh, practice, we do it on top of a feature space because we found that to be much easier to train. So this is going to be, uh, you can think of this as a generator. I think of this more as a transformer or a hallucinator simply because the word transformer is taken. Um, so how, uh, how are we going to use this? Well, we're going to uh, modify the basic meta learning framework in, a, uh, in the following way. We have our training set, a label training set and a test set. We will sample uh, examples from the training set with the labels, feed it through this hallucinator along with some noise to generate additional training examples. These additional training examples will then be combined with the original training set to get an augmented training set. And then we'll feed this augmented training set and the test set into this uh, function edge, the learner. During training, what will happen is we will not only use back propagation to update the parameters of the learner, but we will also update the parameters of G, this function, and uh, this hallucinator. So what this framework provides us in this way is a way to train the hallucinator to produce hallucinations that are useful for this recognition task. So instead of just simply producing realistic examples or diverse examples, it's producing examples that are useful for the recognition task. Note that examples that are useful for the recognition task may in fact neither be realistic nor diverse. It's just examples that are useful for the recognition task. Um, so we tested this on, uh, on our uh, benchmark, which we had released the previous year, um, which has basically um, image, which is designed out of ImageNet. Um, the base classes have roughly a thousand examples per class and the novel classes have roughly um, between one to 20 examples per class. We vary that uh, number um, from one to 20. Um, all the novel classes have the same number of examples. All the base classes have the same number of examples. There are about 300 uh, base classes and roughly uh, 600 novel classes. And the final task is to distinguish between all 1000 classes. This is the result we got. So, um, it's worthwhile looking at the rightmost plot first. So the rightmost plot, um, the two curves in the rightmost plot, they correspond to the improvement we get. So uh, PN stands for prototypical networks. PMN stands for prototypical matching networks, which is another meta learning um, framework. The details don't really matter. And in this plot I'm showing is the improvement in top five accuracy that we get as a function of the number of training examples per novel class. So as you can see, when we have only one exact training example per novel class, we get up to an eight point improvement, which is quite significant compared to uh, several uh, baselines that we tried. Um, I know at, the, the, at this point that many of you may be thinking of um, many different ablations that you could uh, run on many different baselines. Uh, the reviewers were um, wonderful in pointing out all the different things that we should have compared to but didn't. Um, we did end up doing all those ablations um, that uh, I can go into offline. I don't actually want to go into them uh, right now, but um, we did a lot of ablations to figure out exactly where the gain is coming from. And it seemed that it was important to use the uh, augmentation engine in the way that we, um, that I just described. Okay, so we do get uh, significant improvements from between one to eight points from uh, doing this learned data augmentation. 
Um, I should mention that there is actually, this is, we, were, we are not the only people to talk about uh, doing such data augmentation, learned data augmentation for uh, few short learning. Um, there's some relative, there's some early work from uh, 2000 by Eric Leonard Miller and colleagues on MNIST. Um, and there was more recent work where um, uh, Mandar Dixit and colleagues used uh, actually attributes, uh, supervised uh, the these sort of augmentations using attribute information. Okay, now, after we did this work and we saw uh, the great gains, one thing that sort of bothered me was this question of why is this learned data augmentation helping? Um, in particular, what is it actually doing? So um, I asked Yushin, who was the uh, first author in this work, to uh, do a Disney plot of um, the different novel classes and also show where uh, these augmentations were landing in that Disney plot. So here, um, the stars are the training examples. So as you can see, there are very few because this is a few short problem. You have up to five uh, training examples for each class. I think in this case, it's four. And in triangles are the different um, hallucinated examples that the generator produces. And as you can see, the hallucinations do end up um, extending beyond the, the four or five seed examples, and they end up especially um, trying to delineate the boundaries of the different classes. However, one thing that sort of that you uh, is, seems striking from this plot is that if you ignore the um, stars and the triangles for a moment and focus, look at the crosses, which are just the different data points from the different classes, what we see is that the different data points, the different classes are very much separable. They seem to be very nicely separated, but the classes themselves are not compact. They're very spread out in feature space. And the reason why learned data augmentation helps is precisely because they're very spread out. Um, because all these classes are diffuse, we actually need lots of training examples to capture the full extent of the class, and that's why data augmentation helps. So data augmentation is required to capture the diversity of modes. So the fact that data augment, this, this learned data augmentation helps is great, but it also suggests that maybe the feature representation is not very good. In particular, it seems that the feature representation these networks are learning are not actually that invariant to the different modes of intra-class variation. So in particular, what's happening is that even though you know, we imagine that the feature representation a convolutional network learns is great, it's probably not actually that invariant to different transformations. It captures enough discriminative information to distinguish between the different classes, but it's not invariant enough to produce a compact class distribution. So for example, given an image like this, the uh, feature representation might encode the fact that this bird has long legs, but it might also encode the presence of a blue sky, the presence of roof tiles, the presence of leaves, and so on. This is in contrast to what we hope or expect the recognition to system to do, which is that it should maybe characterize the beak shape, the neck shape, the body color, the head pattern, and so on. So it should only focus on features that are invariant to all the different modes of intra-class variation uh, so that the uh, class representation distribution is much more compact. And if the class distribution is much more compact, then you only need a few training examples to characterize um, a class well. So the question is, how can, now, one thing you might say is, well, we had this, I just described this beautiful framework for um, uh, few short learning, for few short learning, which we called meta learning, which a lot of people have been using. Why is in, what's meta learning doing? Is it, is it helping with gen producing these invariant features? And although I don't have a definitive answer to this, oh, sorry, before I go to meta learning, the question is, why, oh, there is a question on why don't convolutional networks learn invariant features by themselves, right? One of the uh, hypotheses that we go with is that through standard training, convolutional networks learn good features by themselves. Now, the problem is that traditionally, the, the traditional training procedure that we use focuses only on class separation. 
two examples which are of different classes should lie on opposite sides of the classification boundary, should lie on the, their respective sides, but nowhere in our classification objective does it, um, do we require the recognition system to push two examples of the same class together. Second, the way, the sort of meta way we do um, training uh, model selection and so forth for traditional recognition, we assume access to a diverse enough training set. We assume that the training distribution is diverse enough to capture essentially all the modes of the test distribution. And finally, we only require in traditional recognition, we only require the method network to generalize to novel examples of the same class, not to new classes entirely. Because of all of this, a lot of the conclusions that we as a community have reached based on traditional recognition may not actually apply to this kind of a few short learning scenario. Now you might ask, well, what about um, meta learning? Well, I don't have a definitive answer, but um, it does seem as if, and there's increasing amounts of evidence, not just from my group, but from uh, others, that meta learning is not all that is, it is slated to be. In particular, on certain settings, it does seem to help, but on others, it does not. So here I'm showing prototypical networks, which is admittedly not the state of the art meta learning technique. But um, on the left plot, this is the accuracy on um, ImageNet, the, the ImageNet benchmark that I just used, where meta learning did provide a significant one to two points improvement. But when we tested the same technique, on a fine grain classification data set with lots of class imbalance, we found that prototypical networks did not actually beat like a standard transfer learning baseline where you just train a standard classification network and chop off the last layer. So how, if meta learning is not increasing in variance, how do we um, actually go about increasing in variance? Um, so at this point, I started wondering whether, you know, as I said, the, we've been um, coming to all these conclusions based on traditional recognition setups. What if we need to revisit some of the conclusions that we've come to? In particular, for many classification problems, we do have plenty of domain knowledge. For example, when we talk about for exa distinguishing between different kinds of birds, we know that these distinctions should rely on the different object parts of the bird, the beak shape, the, beak, the wing color, and so on. The question is, does explicitly encoding this domain knowledge help? Now, you would, I would argue the tradition, the wisdom now seems to suggest that it should not. Like we have uh, now gotten used to the idea that the network should basically just learn these kinds of useful features, learn this, the requisite invariance through end-to-end -end training. But as I just said, maybe that assumption is not correct. So we want to ask whether explicitly encoding domain knowledge can help. So this, is, um, this led to these two papers, one of which appeared last year and the other which is coming out in um, CVPR this year. And um, we, uh, here we looked at, in particular, two kinds of domain knowledge. So the first thing is, was that, you know, if I want invariance to change in backgrounds, if I want, for example, the feature representation to put these two images close together, well, maybe what I should do is I should explicitly separate the foreground and background. And that would give me invariance to changing backgrounds. So, what we are going to do is we are going to see if we can learn from the base classes how to localize this foreground, how to do this sort of foreground background separation, and um, then separately characterize the foreground and background. Um, similarly, when we when I'm uh, uh, if I want to have invariance to changing pose, what I might want to do is I might want to characterize the appearance of the different parts of the object. So for example, the appearance of the eye, the appearance of the beak, and so on. If I do this, then um, if the appearance, if the pose of the bird changes, then the locations of these parts change, but their appearance hopefully does not. This is, so what we, this, um, so basically what we'll do is we learn from the base classes, the classes for which we have lots of examples, we will learn how to localize parts, and then we'll separately characterize each part. So this idea is called uh, post-normalization, 
And in fact, um, you would you might say, oh, this is a really old idea. It is, in fact, really old. Um, and people uh, in the early days of fine grain categorization, there were many variants of uh, post normalization that people had proposed. Um, but when convolutional networks came around, um, this, uh, this idea sort of fell by the wayside. Um, and the reason was that once you have enough training examples, actually, and, and once you don't, once you have enough training examples and you don't need to generalize to novel classes, actually, you know, uh, straightforward training of end-to-end um, -end training of convolutional networks really helps. So um, here, um, this is, oh, I, I'm, I apologize, I forgot to put the citation here. Um, this is a uh, result from a, a workshop paper in 2015 where they found that um, bilinear pooling, which is a uh, pretty uh, straightforward black box module that you can stack onto any uh, convolutional networks, um, significantly outperforms post-normalization. And post-normalization provides very limited gains compared to the uh, to a baseline convolutional networks, but and and it does so at the at um, the expense of twice the number of parameters. However, the key is that these results were in the context of a traditional recognition problem, where there were lots of training examples and no need for generalization to novel classes. Here we have a different problem, which is we want to generalize to novel classes from a few examples. So it is worthwhile revisiting this idea. A second point I want to make is that um, early work on post-normalization, um, the, the way this has been done in the past has been by introducing increasingly sophisticated models that do this kind of normalization. However, one thing we found, have found in our previous work is, and this has been replicated in um, other uh, recent papers in the literature, few shot uh, learning, few shot generalization performance is really dependent on model size. And somewhat um, paradoxically, deeper and larger models seem to generalize better. So if we really want to say, um, to ask whether post-normalization helps or not, then we should introduce post-normalization while, while uh, being very careful about the number of parameters we introduce. So by, by we, the modifications we make should, to the architecture should be extremely light in parameters. So um, this is the architecture we're going with uh, for that reason, because we are interested in a very lightweight module, the architecture is going to be extremely simple. The contribution is not so much in the architecture, architecture but in trying to answer this question of whether um, such localization and post-normalization can help. So, we have an image, we have a convolutional network backbone that can produce a feature map. We're going to take some intermediate uh, feature maps uh, from the convolutional network and pass them through an extremely lightweight, uh, small neural network module that produces a set of heat maps. So these heat maps might be for foreground or they might be for specific body parts. Um, the small, uh, this small module can be as simple as a single uh, one cross one convolution, or the most we've tried is a two layer uh, network, a small two layer convolutional network. Then we get these different heat maps. These might be either foreground, background, or the different key points. And we're basically going to use these um, heat maps as attention weights to um, average pool this uh, large feature map tensor to produce our final feature. Now, um, the key question is how do we train this localization module? Um, this, we have looked at actually three different strategies spread over the two papers that, we, that I described. Um, the simplest strategy is unsupervised localization, which amounts to basically uh, an attention mechanism effectively. So we have our standard few shot learning loss or classification loss or whatever um, that's operating on top of this final feature representation. And the localization module is trained simply based on back propagation from this loss. Um, if we want to ask, now, now this uh, kind of an architecture is basically just an architectural modification. The network has, gets no new information. However, if we really want to encode domain knowledge, we might actually want the network to learn specific, the, the semantic 
um, figure ground masks or the semantic key points that we know a priori. So we also looked at supervised localization. And basically um, what that means is during training, um, the uh, classification uses ground truth uh, key point masks or figure ground masks. And uh, the localization module is trained to replicate this ground truth localization using uh, straightforward uh, laws. And um, at test time, we will not have ground truth uh, heat maps, obviously. So we'll use the output of the localization module. We also considered a version which is which we called few shot localization. So the idea here is that maybe the parts or the notion of figure ground that we learn on the base classes, maybe that does not actually generalize to the novel classes. So if that is the case, we imagine that for the novel classes, we actually do have some localization annotations available. So maybe if I have five novel class examples, one of them is annotated with maybe a bounding box. And what we can do is we can use that one um, image annotated with a bounding box uh, to, lo to learn a localizer specific to this class. So um, in the interest of uh, time, I'm not actually going to describe the details of the few short localization. Um, it's in our last year's CVPR paper. I'm going to go straight to the results. Okay, so this is um, accuracy results on GUB. I'm right now looking only at figure ground localization. And we have here uh, prototypical networks. This is the baseline. Um, in orange are the two different uh, localization uh, branches, uh, localization techniques. One is just uh, supervised localization. The other is few shot localization. Um, both supervised and few shot localization provide a significant gain between roughly around one point to uh, almost three points on top of the standard baseline prototypical networks. This is on CUB. Uh, which is a bird species classification data set. We also tried this on iNaturalist, which is a much larger data set. With when in, in our setup, we had 227 novel classes, and uh, there was also class imbalance. So some classes had as few as two training examples, other classes had as much as 40 training examples. And here again, we saw a significant improvement of up to um, eight points, percentage points between um, the uh, prototypical networks and the few shot localization. Um, we, the pro unsupervised localization in this case also worked really well. Um, so it seemed that for if, if what we want to learn is figure ground, then you don't actually need training labels. The network can in fact figure it out by itself. But even mm -hmm. so explicitly asking it to do that does give you a significant boost in performance. So till now, we've just been talking about figure ground localization. What if we go all the way to post-normalization? What if we explicitly localize all the object parts and characterize them? So this is results using part localization. So again, this is on GUB. Um, this is five shot and 50 classes that the network has to distinguish between. Um, this red bar is the standard prototypical networks with post-normalization. It's uh, trained in the supervised manner. So not unsupervised, not few shot, just traditional supervised local, uh, localization. So to train this, basically, we needed key point annotations on the base classes. We do have experiments in the paper that show that you can actually reduce the number of key point annotations drastically and still get similar gains. So in this case, you can see that the gains are in fact very large. They are on the order of 10 to 15 points. And we found this gain to be very stable. We found similar gains on an aircraft data set. We found so on a fine-grained aircraft classification data set. We found similar gains on uh, by taking this model and then just applying it without any um, retraining to a new or uh, a different bird classification data set. So, as you can see, this is a very large gain. And when I saw this, I was, um, I was surprised that uh, this domain knowledge had this large of an impact. You might ask, where does this gain come from? There are multiple uh, possibilities. 
one possibility is that because we are training to localize key points, maybe that auxiliary training actually improves the underlying feature representation. Um, so we have this other baseline um, through the, the striped baseline that, um, that's, uh, that I'm showing here, where we don't actually do any post-normalization. We do only multitask training. And that also helps, though not quite as much as post-normalization. And interestingly, for post-normalization, the unsupervised version of post-normalization does not work as well as a supervised version. So the unsupervised version works, and in some cases it is it comes close. But what we find is that supervision, providing supervision for the key ground truth part locations on the base classes really does help. And you can see this sort of here. So if you do unsupervised localization and you ask what um, object parts are being discovered by the model, what we find is that the model does not actually discover a consistent set of key points in the sense that, um, for example, the top row here represents sort of the same key point it discovers but applied to multiple images. And in one case, the key point is the base of the neck. In another, it's the eye. In another, it's the wing, and so on. So it does, it's not able to draw these correspondences across widely different bird poses. And this should not be surprising. There is significant literature um, on how to get uh, key points without supervision and how to get these semantic key points without supervision. And the conclusion from that is that it's basically really hard. It's not entirely obvious. Uh, it's an open research question how you can do that. Um, so the, uh, this kind of domain knowledge by incorporating these kinds of part information and asking the network to explicitly localize and characterize semantic parts, it not only helps the uh, model accuracy, but it also effectively makes the model more interpretable. So now we have, uh, sorry, now we have a feature representation that is split up based on the different object parts. And so now you can ask, well, which part feature representation is the most useful for um, recognition of a particular class by simply dropping that feature, uh, that part feature from the representation. And we find that if you do this, this notion of part importance um, that the model has learned actually corresponds very well to the notion of part, uh, the, the parts that experts mention when they describe these birds in online field guides. Finally, one very interesting thing, because the performance improvement using post-normalization is so large, what we found was that a four layer, a small four layer convolutional network trained with post-normalization actually outperforms an 18 layer network, uh, an 18 layer ResNet 18 trained without post-normalization. So this is in fact surprising. And what this suggests is that in the context of few shot generalization, deeper is not always better. Incorporating this kind of domain into domain insight can actually um, allow you to have much smaller models. Um, we also showed that this improved post-normalization helps over other future learning techniques. In, in particular, there is this uh, last block, couple of bars shows improvement with relative to uh, this technique called dynamic uh, future uh, learning, which is uh, based on some sort of a big generation scheme. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. Okay, um, so with this, um, with all these results, I want to sort of end with a thought experiment based on this kind of, um, based on extrapolating, admittedly extrapolating sort of quite far afield from the results that I just showed, which is that what if, you know, this uh, for few short generalization, um, if the domain knowledge is really so important, then maybe we should consider revisiting even how we define the interface between a human teacher and a machine learner. So usually for a lot of uh, the, uh, the kinds of few shot learning uh, problems I described, they come up a lot in the context of fine grained classes or in the context of um, experts who need to train uh, recognition systems for their domain of expertise. 
and for example, you know, ornithologists in this case. And experts usually have a lot of information about different cl classes that they can provide to the learner. So there's this question of whether we can train machines um, not using just image class label pairs the way we've usually done, but by providing this extra uh, domain information about uh, what distinguishes a novel class from uh, its siblings. Um, so that's about it. So in conclusion, um, we have a still, even with all these results, we have quite a big gap between full supervision and limited supervision. So there's a while to go. Um, if there's sort of two uh, things you want to take away from this, one is that I'd argue that in spite of what we might think, um, the feature representation strain learned by convolutional networks do not actually, they're not actually invariant to these common modes of variation. So we need to either incorporate um, intelligent data augmentation or um, some sort of domain knowledge to increase this invariance. And with that, I'm going to end and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Bharat. Uh, does anyone have a question? So I, I have a question about the uh, unsupervised uh, localization. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is, is that being trained also in a meta learning framework? Like, is it taking explicitly as input the data set of, of images or it's trained like across all the so classes? So we did both. So the when we the most recent set of results we have, we actually had um, three different techniques, um, and we trained it on all three. So um, one is sort of the transfer learning. Or we can train it on all three. One is sort of a transfer learning baseline, which is just you know train a classifier and then test, right? One is using prototypical networks. So there we did the meta learning sort of episodic training, and the third is using. Actually, I don't know if the remember what the I need to check what the unsupervised learning, uh, just whether we have unsupervised localization results on that. But this dynamic few shot thingy, which is sort of, um, which has a little bit of meta learning, which is also has a little bit of meta learning, but it's sort of a second stage. So the feature representation is trained without any meta learning, and then there's a second stage trained with meta learning. So yeah, so we tried both. Um, and I think I forget now, but some uh, in some cases it works similar to uh, gets close to the uh, supervised localization performance for key points. Um, in others, it's uh, much lower. And is it more interpretable when the amount of like images it has been trained with is more constrained, like in the meta learning setting? Uh, not really. Um, yeah. So the unsupervised key points always ended up being sort of funky. Um, and even there's a lot of redundancy and repetition. I should mention that there are ways of getting unsupervised key points that actually solve some of the problems we were uh, doing. In particular, there's a line of work from uh, Andrea Vidaldi's group on doing um, sort of incorporating all sorts of these consistency and diversity kind of um, losses. We didn't try all of that, but yeah. Um, the simple way that we tried did not actually end up being more interpretable. Thanks a lot. All right. Uh, I guess if there are no more questions, uh, thanks a lot, Parath, again. Yeah. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, and there's a spreadsheet uh, for people in case they want to talk privately with, with Parath. And the talk will be recorded. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>